So our next presenter is Freck Boss from TU Eindhoven, and he is presenting on reinforcement of layer extrusion, 3D print, 3D, 3D concrete printing. Okay. Um, um, yeah, thanks very much for uh, inviting me uh, to speak here. And uh, I'm the last speaker of, uh, uh, of this part of the session. I, I guess you were about to set off for lunch and, and we on this part of uh, in Europe where we are, we are about to set off on our weekend of Easter. We uh, and Eindhoven have worked uh, on a number of uh, reinforcement concepts. You already saw in the previous presentation some of our, our pictures uh, uh, passing the uh, uh, the presentation. Um, before I uh, you know, um, start and explain something about the research that we've done in that area, I would like to stress again the extreme importance that we get this issue um, that, we, that we get this issue solved of how to uh, reinforce uh, printed concrete structures. Because, um, yeah, there's a, I think there's a real, uh, of course we know that in the conventional risks of, uh, you know, having no reinforcement in concrete structures due to the brittleness of the material. But the fact that we're printing in, in small layers, uh, we're printing without formwork, so we have less control over the curing. Um, makes it all the more important that we get some kind of ductility and robustness in our in our structures. And um, then just to to underline that importance, uh, here I'm, I'm showing uh, a uh, pavilion uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working on uh, two years ago uh, when I was visiting the university in Innsbruck in Austria. So um, a small pavilion that we we made in about twelve weeks. Um, looks very nice at the end, but it, it was not without its uh, share of problems. Uh, and, and this was one of the first things that um, yeah, can go wrong. So you, you work with these relatively thin walled elements and you, know, you rush them to site and you're just a little bit too quick to unload them from your truck. And uh, you know, the forklift driver was just slightly uncareful and bumped into these these elements and yeah, they're they're quite fragile. Um, and even though you, so you see some of this reinforcement that was there for let's say structural safety purposes, you see it um, appearing. This is kind of a similar carbon-based reinforcement that uh, Victor Mastarin was was presenting before. Um, yeah, it still leaves you with a uh, with a broken element, which obviously you cannot really put in your structure. So this element had to be reprinted. Um, so there's there's not only the um, to the, the the static mechanical loads that we're used to that that you need to take into account, but once you're working with this uh, this these uh, these kind of topologies. Other other factors come into play that that have no, yeah, were maybe previously were not so important in, in structural concrete. Uh, and the other risk I really want to point to is uh, shrinkage cracks, um, and that also happened here. And, and um, I I know it has also happened in other concrete uh, printed concrete structures. And actually, um, in, in in conventional cast concrete, it also happens, but they were not so worried about it. But really. Um, this um, the, you know, these materials are more susceptible to it, um, but also their their topology and their 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 way they're may be made makes them even more sensitive to it, uh, and that really means that um, yeah, putting the right kind of reinforcement in the structure is extremely important, and I believe that uh, sometimes uh, I see that you know approaches that okay let's just stay under the tensile strength limit of the concrete. Or we'll see it as, as um, more or less as unreinforced masonry. Is it is it is it is a tricky approach? Uh, so you, you have to really be careful that these these kinds of cracks really break your structure into separate pieces. So um, I'm sure that you know everybody that in this session kind of realizes that I just want to underline this um, um, these risks that are involved in in um, in. Uh, yeah, the, the development of printed concrete without, if, if, the, if the reinforcement technology is not keeping up with the developments, then uh, we, you know, we might be in a tricky spot. 
So having said that, um, yeah, um, obviously when we need reinforcement in, in printed concrete, and uh, there, there are a lot of there's a number of typical issues with uh, reinforcing um, layer extrusion printed concrete. Um, you know, some are related to you know, the process and integrating the, the reinforcement application into the process. Um, one of one other aspect is that maybe goes above it is that we have a directional dependency. So um, there's a distinct you know, direction of layer extrusion uh, concrete, um, and and the solution that uh, reinforcement solution that that you can provide uh, is is related to each of the of the principal directions um, in concrete, which you know in a paper a couple of years ago I designated them as, as U, V, and W, uh, related to the print path where, where U is in the direction of the print path itself in the print plane and V is in the is perpendicular to that but still in the print plane and then W is, is perpendicular to the print plane. Um, and they all have their, their typical aspects. And one, one is, the, well, in the direction of the filament makes a, has, has limitations to what you can place and what you cannot place. Um, uh, that makes a simultaneous placement possible, which is for the other two directions. I don't really see that as a as a, as a possibility. Anyway, I haven't seen any examples that, that use that. The other two directions, V and W, are more suitable for um, for what was called in the in the paper that uh, Victor Mcturin was presenting uh, was was describing in the previous presentation. Uh, as contiguous, so kind of intermittent. So we have you know, one, one layer of concrete coming and then something happening and another layer of concrete, something happening, etc. Another typical thing is that the, um, if you're considering um, reinforcement in the V and W directions, you often have to deal with uh, crossing the boundaries, the interlayers, uh, the, the interfaces of, of subsequent layers. Uh, and, and in the W direction, you're usually talking about a lot of a lot of layers. So you have, you have this stack of layers that you have to go through uh, completely. And in the V direction, it's more that you have an in, uh, incidental crossing of layers that you might need. So you, you see a lot of these wall structures with an internal kind of you know zigzag shape. But you know well, how how good is that attachment of that of that angle with with the straight lines? And um, how do you ensure that, that those parts are staying connected? It's uh, also, uh, I think, uh, we will also need reinforcement concepts for that. So these, yeah, when you're thinking about developing solutions, so this, this is kind of a, one of the first items to think about and for what direction am I developing this solution? Now, we've seen already that, uh, that um, a lot of ideas are being developed. I think uh, what we see in this picture is one of the first things was just to use the concrete as, as loss formwork. And then after that, a lot of other ideas came. And um, well, I need this, so I also put in the, the, the paper that uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working with a lot of uh, international colleagues uh, to, to try to get some, some overview of all these different things that are being done and ways to, to compare them and to to analyze them respective to each other. And that gave um, this, this classification, so Victor already um, explained it uh, more in depth than I was, was planning to. Um, maybe he, he also had a nicer, nicer version of this graph. Um, I think what, what the, the, the two points that I want to highlight, I think is the, um, what is crucial is that the, the time of reinforcement, the integration, so are we doing it pre-process? That is kind of, we're, we're developing material that is already has some ductility and robustness in itself by applying, usual, by, usually by applying fibers to the material itself. Um, prior to the concrete shaping, so that is so you replace the reinforcement first and then you apply the concrete. Um, after the concrete shaping, that is first print the concrete and then apply the reinforcement. And, and I think the, the most, perhaps the most challenging one is during the concrete shaping, which is also, I think, in the end, where we want to go, that we can get some kind of integrated solution. Um, and the other yeah, main uh, criterion for the, um, for the classifications is some of the key features 
um, and entrainment directly, so simultaneous, completely with the deposition of the concrete, or something that is happening between the layers, or something that's happen, happening across the layers, but then we're always talking about contiguous processes. Um, so in Eindhoven, we've been working on concrete uh, printing uh, for about well, almost six years now, and uh, you know, so we soon realized that the importance of reinforcement was actually in the early years. The question I got most asked also by the general public, yeah, but what about the reinforcement? I don't know yet. So we, we tried a lot of different stuff. Um, so we, we've been active in, in all these parts of the, of, the, of the graph. And we're currently most working at um, uh, fiber reinforced solutions, so particularly printable strain hardening cementitious composites, uh, as well as cable reinforcement and screw reinforcement, which I will show later on. So that the most, well, I'd say that the, maybe the, the first step to look is, okay, we we'll want to make a reinforcement solution. Why not make the material itself less brittle and uh, so that maybe we don't need a separate reinforcement anymore. Uh, so um, in the 1990s, uh, the concept of, of uh, strain hardening cementitious composites or engineered cementitious composites, as they're also known, um, was developed by Professor Victor Lee uh, in, in Michigan, and um, uh, yeah, by by by, by fine-tuning the the fiber content um, and the the microstructural design of the of the material, uh, it, it was possible to develop um, yeah, highly ductible, bendable concretes. And you know, if you put them in a four-point bending test, it looks something like this. Um, so it's perhaps not, not a, uh, such a unique idea to, to consider, okay, can, can we maybe make a printable version out of this? Uh, so we've worked on that um, in, in Eindhoven. I, I know also there's another couple of other groups that have been, been working on this. Uh, and we in Eindhoven, we're actually now doing a joint project with the, with the TU Delft, trying to kind of systematically develop these kinds of materials. And then, First question is um, what? Well, look at the print process in different steps, and um, this was presented in a in a paper um, we did with a you know, number of uh, uh, I think renowned researchers that are known from from uh, SHCC research. Um, this was published uh, last year and kind of broke down the. Um, uh, the whole process of, of printing into different aspects and looked at what the what it meant if to include fibers in there. And actually, it means that it, in almost all these aspects of printing, it has an influence, and most of the times it's uh, it doesn't make life easier, but in the end, the the um, it does also solve a number of, of problems. One of the recent um, things that uh, a couple of students uh, in uh, in Eindhoven have I've worked on was um, uh, to test the fresh fresh state of uh, of a of a printable uh, SHCC that that we, that we developed because well it is um, to print um, to print concrete or to print mortar um, a number of let's say, printability requirements have been have been identified one of the important ones is the the so called buildability so how well can you you build a concrete structure, uh, the, uh, the printed concrete structure during the printer without it falling over. And you need a couple of tests to uh, determine the material parameters so that you can determine something like buildability. So we we tried also to apply those tests to, to SHCC and, and actually found that it was not so, there, there are some important differences with the um, I would say regular printable mortars that we we also use a lot in our in our research. Um, what we one to, one of the tests that we applied, which is suitable for these kinds of materials, is, is RAM extrusion. That is that works. Uh, you can apply that to to these kinds of materials. The disadvantage is doesn't does not give you directly parameters that we know how to use in in printability or buildability models. So we looked at we, we know a number of other tests, um, like the reometer is, is used uh, quite a lot uh, to determine printability parameters. Uh, unfortunately, this one uh, didn't work. The material was way too stiff to, 
to get this machine to, to turn. And, uh, but another one is a uniaxial compression test, uh, unconfined uniaxial compression test, where we, uh, we determine the, um, uh, obviously the compressive strength, but you can also look at the compressive stiffness, which you might need for buildability models. And that works. Uh, as expected, what perhaps is noticeable is that um, uh, the failure behavior is not really the same as in uh, other printable mortars that, that for instance, the Weber Bamex material that we use a lot, because it even after a while, this material doesn't doesn't show any uh, shear fracture planes, uh, which you, you often get in this kind of test. Um, and that, that raises, so this is more of the bulging. I, I, from the other mortars, I only know this from very early age, like up to five minutes. But this, is, this keeps on bulging. And, and you know, considering that their fibers are there, it's, it could be understandable. But it might mean that if you look at material failure models, you, you cannot apply the same criteria for this um, as for... Uh, for the, those other types of models. So in particular, I'm thinking this might be more for MESA criteria. The other one might be more more Coulomb criteria. But that will be stuff for further research. Other tests that we, we, we tried to apply was a direct shear test. It's also, we, we use that a lot to characterize uh, buildability requirements, but this does not work on the fiber reinforced on, on this printable ICHCC because you, you don't get the, the good shear plane. Some other aspects that are related to uh, printable SHCC. Uh, important one is the fiber orientation. So normally you would assume a completely random distribution. Uh, but when you start printing, you would expect more that the fibers are aligned in the print path. Uh, and that obviously has a, you know, that means that they only work in well in one direction. Now, what we've noticed is that fortunately it does not really work like this. Um, the actual distribution is more something like this. So you, you get the, the flow of material out of the nozzle is not, the speed is not the same everywhere. So it tends to, to push the fibers a little bit you know, to the side. Um, so if we look at a, a histogram of fiber orientations, it's actually not really the, the, the direction of the printing was not the, the main orientation of the fibers that were. So, yeah, they were under an angle, which is, for you know, effective working in different directions was good. The question that still remains is how does it work across the layers because those fibers don't stick out of the layers. And uh, Professor Lee uh, already published some research on that that you can solve this with making a little bit of a, a hook in, into the filament. We are working on to, to confirm that hopefully it works. Um, but this yeah, it remains a point of attention when you're looking at fibers as your solution for reinforcement. Um, well, our research is continuing on finding out further this uh, fiber uh, alignment um, and, and how is it, um, uh, how does it, and how, how are those fibers organized in the in the matrix? It's a, it's a difficult uh, issue to solve because these types of fibers are difficult to scan in, in CT scanning. Um, but we have a PC working on, on neural networks to, uh, to, to analyze that. Um, yeah, considering the time, I'll go on to uh, more quickly. So what, another thing that we did was print the same material on two, two different printing facilities. Uh, left one is our big facility in Eindhoven, and the right one is a much smaller one at, at the TU Delft. We, we try to use as much as possible, more or less the same methodology, but we have, of course, a smaller mixer in Delft, a smaller pump, everything, but the principle of the pump and everything is still the same. It is really important to realize that even with keeping as much the same as possible, the results were fairly different. Um, for instance, in the air void content, also stuff like uh, fiber balls that might happen in one pump but not in the other um, and um, and effects of batch size or so the, the amount of material that you need to mix and um, this so the colleagues from Delft like to show this this picture because it shows that the performance of the Delft specimens was much better than the, in our facility but I think this is a this is extremely important to realize that 
the behavior can be quite different, uh, even though you, you try to keep as many parameters the same as possible. So there's a significant limitation on um, uh, the validity of results, I think, from the, or have only been tested on one print facility. Um, and here you see that the initial strength between both places is off by about 30%, and also the post-peak strength is, uh, there's a significant difference. Some other concepts we, we also work with is to put other, other research, other fibers, glass fibers, uh, in uh, not directly into the mixture, but adding them later, closer to the nozzle. This actually also gives us quite good results with glass fiber. And then I'll just move on to this one. So this is also seen before uh, we entrain a high strength steel cable into the concrete. We developed this about four years ago. The main issue that remains with this is, um, is the bond between the concrete and the, uh, and the steel cable. And it is, you see that back in a lot of, uh, maybe in all reinforcement developments, if you work with these very stiff mixes, uh, like the, with the, that are close to the infinite brick regime, uh, they, tend not to flow very well around whatever concrete, whatever reinforcement you put in there. Uh, and um, so we, we, we tested this at first with very small cables that are really flexible and could follow the funny shapes, but they were not strong enough. Then we used stronger cables, but they tend to, tend to slip out. We researched that further, and you see that the concrete has difficulty flowing really around the cable and compacting very well around it. So, you really need to optimize the design of your of the nozzle and maybe also tune the fluidity of the concrete a bit to get this right. And the effect was that we tried to, so first we did pull out tests on smaller specimens and then try to get come to a point where we could actually break the reinforcement cable. But when we were extending the abetment length, um, we couldn't get the force to go higher. So the, the these these cavities around the cable that that um, yeah, make that it was not impossible. It was not possible to break the, the cable, um, which makes it, the behavior very ductile, but also quite unpredictable. Uh, so these are really things that need to be solved. And this is almost my final slide. There's another reinforcement concept we're working on with a PhD student that's screw reinforcement. So we that is in the other in the other two directions can be effective. And by screwing in a material a, a a bar or a screw thing, um, you can go around the problem of having a good bond. Uh, so having cavities, they don't occur when you screw the material in. We you know, try to pull out strength and you know, seem to find, but there's an early finding that the longer you wait, the weaker the pull out strength is. I assume there's something to do with micro cracking that occurs when you uh, place the, the reinforcement screw. Unfortunately, there was one final result at the latest time that the strength was suddenly higher. So this, there was small amounts of specimen. So we're looking into that further. Um, yeah, so the main challenges remain the, the, let's say the interaction between the equipment and reinforcement materials and the interaction between the reinforcement materials and the printable mortar. Um, and that is, that is a, a big challenge now. I had one last slide, but the um, previous speaker already showed this as well. If you're interested in joining the one of these random committees, um, uh, contact uh, the uh, people that the names that are on this slide. With that, um, thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, and if there's time left, <laughs> I will take them. Thank you.